Okay, we're all set. Okay, anybody want to say something? I mean, you know, the staff say something before I launch into the statement. Last chance. Okay, here we go. Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board for the National Register of Historic Places. My name is Kristen Anderson. I'm currently chair of the review board. The board's purpose this evening is to consider the nomination of properties to the National Register of Historic Places. As most of you know, the National Register is a federal list of those places deemed worthy of preservation. A nomination form has been completed for each of the properties that will be considered tonight. Each nomination form has been sent to the review board members, and each member has had an opportunity to study it prior to this meeting. The owners of nominated properties, local officials, and interested local groups have been notified of this meeting. All have been invited to send written comments about the nomination and to attend this meeting. Some of you may wish to speak this evening about a particular property. You're welcome to do so, and I encourage you to address yourself to the question of whether that property meets the criteria of significance of the National Register. These criteria are the standards against which the review board will evaluate the nominations. This evaluation is the board's only assignment. These criteria have been established by federal regulation. Copies of the criteria have been sent to owners of nominated properties and to the other parties I mentioned earlier. A description of the National Register program has also been sent to them. So just click on Each that. of the nominations will be presented by a staff member. Persons viewing the meeting remotely will then be given an opportunity to comment. These comments should be limited to three minutes. The State Historic Preservation Review Board will then discuss the nomination and a vote by the board will follow. Should a nomination be determined this evening to meet the criteria for inclusion in the National Register, the nomination will be forwarded to the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, Amy Spong. Should she agree that the property meets the criteria and that the nomination is in proper form, she will sign the nomination and forward it to the National Register Office in Washington, D.C., where it will be reviewed once more. The process is a lengthy one, but it is calculated to subject each property to rigorous evaluation. Before we begin, I would like the members of the State Historic Preservation Review Board to introduce themselves, briefly stating the role they fill on the review board and their particular expertise. And alphabetically, I'll go first. I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm one of the architectural historians on the board. Board member Brunfeld, are you here this evening? Okay, we'll come back if she arrives. Board member Decker. John, are you there? Can you introduce yourself? Okay, we'll keep going. Board member Dyer. Hey, Chair Anderson. Yes. This is Amy Spong. I did, Hi, um, I, I was getting a little uh, feedback and so I did mute John, but I noticed that he is logged in twice. Twice, it I was saw that. Three times, so he might, be, he might be just trying to get back in again. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll try one more time since you've brought him up. John, John Decker, are you there? Okay, not at the moment. That's cool. Uh, board member Dyer. Hey, good evening. I'm Lindsay Dyer. I'm a member at large and I am a partner with Design Research Collective. I'm also a librarian and archivist. Thank you. Thanks. Board member James. Hi, I'm Elliot James. I'm one of the historians on the board and I work as assistant professor of history at the University of Minnesota Morris. Thank you. Board member Koski. Uh, I am Philip Koski. I am a historical architect serving on the board and I am a practicing architect in downtown Minneapolis. Thank you. Board member Lavasser. Hi, I'm Andrea Lavasser and I am the prehistoric archaeologist on the board <laughs> and I am retired from the Chippewa National Forest about uh, 10 years now. Thank you. Board member Mann. Hi, my name is Rob Mann. I am a, uh, an associate professor of anthropology at St. Cloud State University, and I am the historical archaeologist on the board. Thank you. Board member Olson. Calling again. Board member Olson. Okay, we'll come back again just in case he shows up. Board member Schulke. 
Hi, Chris Schulke. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Otter Hill County Historical Society, and I'm uh, the local historian on the board, I guess. And board member Solomonson. Uh, yes, I am Catherine Solomonson, and I teach architectural history in the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota, and I'm an architectural historian on the board. Thank you. Board member Stark. Hi, I'm John Stark. I'm a historical architect on the board and a practicing architect in the Twin Cities. Thank you. Board member Warner. Hi, I'm Mary Warner. I'm executive director of the Morrison County Historical Society and I'm a member at large. Thank you. And board member White. Okay, so we'll try one more time. Uh, those that we missed, board member Brunfeld. Board member Decker. Hi, am I reverberating or not? Yes, you yeah. are. No. Can hear you. No, we can yeah. hear you. Go ahead. Oh, you can you hear me? Oh, yeah. um, I'm John Decker. I work with the Stearns History Museum um, and I'm a member at large and uh, I'll be retiring for the second time next month. So oh. That's it. And do we have board member Olson? And board member White. Well, we've sort of done the roll call, but we'll just run through everybody again. Let me know if you're present. Board member Anderson, present. Board member Brunfeld. Board member Decker. Hi. Thank you. Board member Dyer. Present. Board member James. Present. Board member Koski. Present. Board member Lavasser. I'm here. Board member Mann. Present. Board member Olson. Board member Schulke? Here. Board member Solomonson? Here. Board member Stark? Here. Board member Warner? Here. Board member White? Okie doke. We got it. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to approve the minutes from the April 6th meeting. Any comments or corrections on the minutes? I make uh, board member Schulke. I make a motion to accept those uh, minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Member Warner, I'll second. Thank you. Any other discussion? Well, I was just going to ask for all those in favor to say hi, but that's not how we do it. <laughs> board member Anderson votes yes. Board member Decker. John, are you there? Aye. Thank you. Board member Dyer. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Koski. Board member Koski. Aye. Take the minutes. Thank you. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Schulke. Aye. Board, board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. Board member Warner. Hi. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, we didn't approve the agenda, but um, I've been asked to add something at this point. Uh, we have some announcements from the SHPO staff. And so we're adding them in as item number 3.5. So, Amy, is that you? That is me. Thank you very okay. much. And hello, everyone. It's good to see most of you. Um, this evening, I just realized I was so um, concerned about making sure I was going to get all of my announcements lined up that I forgot my little um, cheat sheet that I use um, that that just cites the state statute that allows us, us to have um, a public meeting virtually <laughs> because we are in times of still of of COVID with uh, meeting restrictions. So um, I don't have the specific citations, but. Um, we are we are already following um, those uh, that guidance by doing roll calls and making sure that everyone uh, can be heard. And so we we have done that. Um, so members of the public, when we do get to the public portion, um, we have a couple uh, SIPO staff that are moderating. Um, there, I, I think somewhere there is a raised hand symbol. Although um, I have to admit my. Um, this application looks a little different from other WebEx meetings that we've hosted. So um, it's probably still in the little um, smile emoji 
um, where you can raise your hand. Yes, you can. So it's the little icon that's a smile. If you click on that, um, members of the public, when it does, when we get to that time, we can um, you can use the raise hand feature that works really well, and we can call on call on people to to do that. Um, just a couple um, additional updates. <laughs> John found his button. That's great. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, thanking all of the state review board members that participated in our engagement process with our state review, um, our, our state preservation plan. Um, the, we, you were all interviewed and you all took, took part in several other engagements, but this last, um, from May 26th through July 25th, we had the draft plan open for public comment. And I wanna thank anyone um, who provided even additional feedback for us on our draft plan. We have closed that public comment period, um, we did get, uh, you know, I think a, probably a, a fair number. It's a, it's a long document. It's a lot to ask of, uh, of anyone to review a document that um, has a lot of information in it. Um, but we actually got uh, more formal comments from the uh, MPCA, from the University of Minnesota, um, I'm trying to think of the other, uh, there was a couple other agencies that I'm forgetting now, and I've got uh, the Historical Society is looking at it. They were a little late, but they asked to take a, a look at it as well. Oh, um, Rethos is the statewide nonprofit that provided uh, a really good review, thorough review for us. So we're, we're really fortunate with those, all the feedback that we received. We're now taking all those comments, responding to them, reacting to them, and uh, we will be making edits. We are also hoping to have an editor on board and even some graphic design help to make the, the uh, document a little more dynamic. And I especially wanted to call out um, a board member Dyer who did take the time and went through and edited, hand edited and made comments on a paper copy and dropped it in the mail to us. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, board member Dyer for doing that. So our goal to get this off, uh, the final edited uh, draft version for the park service is the end of September. We have a little bit of flex, flex time in there for early October uh, if we need that extra time. But I just wanted to provide everyone with those updates. Uh, many of you might have heard that we did get our state historic tax credit extended by the legislature during this last special session. It was not the time period that we were hoping for. It only got extended for one year. So we are kind of working under another year of sunset. And because of that, um, one of the state requirements in order to get an allocation certificate by next June 30th of 2022, uh, property has to be listed on the National Register. And so we are gonna have our, we've made the decision for our state review board 2022 meetings are going to be very similar to last year's schedule. So we do have those dates that we'll be getting those out to everyone. Uh, but the dates for next year for our state review board are February 15th, April 12th, August 16th, and November 15th. And what this does is it allows for the February and more, more importantly, that April meeting to follow the National Park Service review time for National Register nominations and be able to come back and get those nominated on, on the register by that June 30th deadline, which is one of the, the things that needs to happen. So I wanted to just give everybody a heads up on that. The other um, item that is contingent on those first two meeting dates, the February and the April dates of next year, um, means that we are also, we've also made the decision that we're going to continue those meetings virtually. Um, that makes things easier for staff and everyone. Um, we will revisit this um, for our, our August meeting and November meetings in next year. So just wanted to let everyone know. And our agency is looking at various things like hybrid solutions you know, equipping meeting rooms to, that we could have a joint, you know, some people in person, some people hybrid uh, and continue uh, this as an option. So those, those are things that the agency is, is looking at and exploring for, 
for us and for, for the board as well. And then finally, I just wanted to give a quick mention, things with COVID and the pandemic of, as we all have been hearing are, are still a little fluid, but we have uh, begun as a state agency and as a division to, uh, we've begun this, uh, what we're calling RTO planning, it's return to office planning. And we are looking at doing this in a hybrid manner. Um, we have right now we have we're looking at kind of a phased plan between mid September to the early part of November. Obviously, these dates are all very fluid, but um, we are we are starting this this planning process and we've been at it for a little while now already um, in, since July. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that that's something that we're working on with our with. Uh, the Department of Administration, um, but we're also following along as new policies and things come forward. And um, it, it is a pretty fluid situation as as I'm sure you all are aware of as well. So, are there any questions on any of those announcements? All right, hearing none, I think we can jump right in. Thanks, Amy. So our first nomination this evening is the Sherburne Community Building in Sherburne Martin County. And uh, our presenter is Ginny Way. I did it wrong. Hold please. I don't know why this is always so complicated for me. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Thank you. All right. Our first um, nomination tonight, as uh, Chair Anderson said, is the Sherburne Community Building in Sherburne, Ottertail County. The authors are Jamie Ladvig and Daniel Kiso, Bolton, Mink, and Cork. The Sherburne Community Building is located at 116 Main Street in Sherburne. Oh, uh, Ottertail County, Minnesota, designed by New Ulm architect Albert G. Plagens. The building was constructed in 1940 in a restrained Art Deco style. Here we see the west facade, camera facing northwest, northeast, excuse me. The town I am not Sherburne. the west facade. I'm only seeing the presentation format. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Thank Jenny, you. I'm not seeing it. it either. Is that it? Can it be made um, larger? Can it be, yeah. yeah. Can you make that larger? Sure. Oh, what about that? Yes. Wonderful. So now you just see the picture. Yeah, the the box didn't grow any bigger, but uh, the picture did. Yeah, for some reason, it's only on half of your half of the. There we go. Yay. Oh, can you see my notes as well? No, no they're they're grayed no. out, but they are taking up space. Oh, bummer! How am I going to do this, John? Now it's good, but you can't see your notes, correct? But I can't see my okay. notes. <laughs> Hold on just one more second. I'm going to stop sharing again. This is very exciting. We actually ran through this beforehand so that that we would not have this problem. And yet, <coughs> this is probably not going to change anything. Except I can't see my notes. I'm afraid. Right, I'm going to have to make these very small in the corner. I apologize, y'all. Maybe I can read them when they're this little. Okay. So the Sherburne Community Building is located in 116 uh, Main Street in Sherburne, Ottertail County, Minnesota. Designed by New Ulm architect Albert G. Plagens, the building was constructed in 1940 as a, in the restrained Art Deco style. Here we see the west facade camera facing uh, northeast. The town site of Sherburne was platted in 1884 following the construction of the Southern Minnesota Railroad in 1878. The community building is located just north of the Sherburne Commercial Historic District, which is comprised mostly of brick buildings constructed between 1898 and 1905 in styles typical of the early rural railroad communities. At the left, we see the east facade camera facing west, and at the right is the south and east facades camera facing northwest. Oh, I'm never going to be able to read that. 
The building was constructed with the help of federal funding authorized in response to the financial hardships related to the Great Depression. In 1936, oh, I'm sorry. Oops. This is going to be extra fun in the, the uh, do the video later. All right. Um, in 1933, the federal government instituted the Public Works Administration which provided funding to hire professionals to construct large scale state projects. In 1938, the community building uh, was built at an estimated cost of $50,000. The side, the facade of the, this facade displays the restrained Art Deco style, which is indicative and common for WA, w, PWA buildings and is easily recognizable amid neighboring downtown buildings. Here we see again the west facade, camera facing north, and a 1939 view um, shortly before the building's completion from roughly the same angle. Man. The building was constructed with the help of federal funding authorized. Say it again. At the interior, the main floor contains. Oh, this is too, this is terrible, y'all. Hold on just a second. <laughs> this is just awful. You can, sh you can shrink the image a little bit more. Can so I? You and more you can see, it's, it's, prob it's probably a lot less um, distracting than me going back and forth 100,000 times as I try to read these notes, which I basically had memorized earlier, but now they aren't because I'm nervous and there's a bunch of people watching me. Brittany, you are handling this like a champ as always, and it is awesome. <laughs> Dave, well done. David, this is why you're so lovely. Okay, <laughs> so as, you can just look at two different pictures. At the, at the interior, the main floor contains the concession stand, auditorium, bathrooms, crying room, and original box office. The second floor contains the council chambers, the theater production room, and the vault. The basement contains a community hall with a platform, storage room, kitchen, check room, and utilities room. At the right, is a detail of the box office, camera facing north. West at center is the first floor stairs, camera facing east, and at left is a view of the crying room, camera facing southeast. The building was Shermer's first community space and movie theater. The auditorium and stage have been used as a theater, both productions and movies since its construction. To illustrate the space's significance, in 1956, the city of Sherburn ordered rent to be free for the theater in order to keep it in business. Here we see the auditorium camera facing east. Historically, the basement was used as, the bank, as a banquet hall, banquet and dining hall, as well as a space in which to host meetings for various groups and organizations. The use of the property remains largely the same today. At left is the council chambers, camera facing northwest. At right is the dining hall platform, camera facing northwest. The period of significance for the property is 1940 to 1971. The level of significance is local. National Register criteria are A and C. The areas of significance are architecture and entertainment and recreation. The period of significance begins when construction of the building was completed and ends in 1971, reflecting the continued significance of the building to the present day. The Sherburg Community Building is being listed in association with the Multiple Property Documentation Form, Federal Relief Construction in Minnesota, 1933 to 1943. To quote the nomination, in addition to being built using WPA funds, requirement one, and constructed prior to 1943, requirement two, the Sherburn Community Building represents a significant contribution to the community, as no such space previously existed. The Sherburn Community Building is a distinct local example of the Art Deco style. The style is commonly associated with the municipal buildings constructed by the WPA. The Sherburn Community Building was constructed using WPA funds and was the city's first and only indoor community gathering space once construction was completed in 1940. The building is still used today as the city's only movie theater and local theater production venue, and the basement is still used as, meeting, as a meeting place. For these reasons, the Sherburn Community Building is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Any correspondence, yes. Jenny? There is no correspondence related to this. Uh, Would you like to visit the crying room at the Sherburn Community Center? 
one of those kind of nice so far, right? Do I, do I need to? You have a row. No, no. You, you did a, a spectacular job under the circumstances. <laughs> you're, you're kind to me. <laughs> well, no. No matter how you prepare for stuff like this, there's always something that goes wrong, eh? It's true. Uh, is there anyone in the uh, audience who would like to make a comment about this nomination? I'm looking at, I'm not sure what, I'm hoping that we've got staff members who are looking for raised hands or whatever it takes to get on the agenda. Anyone? Nope, I'm not seeing any, any hands. Okay. So I'm looking. Well, you can, you can join us when you're ready and board members, any comments, questions, discussion about this property. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hey, well, just uh, I have a, this board member Schulke, just a quick Thank comment you. that yeah, hello. We hear you. Okay, so uh, in your present, I think the early slide you said it's Otter Hill County. Just make sure you correct that to it's, Martin County. It's Martin. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Sir, and I have a question. Or Member Lavasser? I've, I've never heard of a crying room before, and here we have two nominations, each with crying rooms. What is a crying room? I can I can answer that not from historical research, but from a as a mother. A crying <laughs> room is is a space in which if you have a young child who is acting up in a particular venue, you can take them there, and there is it, it's enclosed so that other patrons are not disturbed. But theoretically, you can still see or hear the production going on. We often see them in churches. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. That makes perfect sense. You're welcome. This is board member Koski. I have a couple of comments and questions. Go ahead. Um, the first one is related to the period of significance. Um, the photo, the historical photo with the marquee that we're looking at right now. Um, I believe in the packet was dated 1939. That's accurate. And I did the extra homework of looking up the movie poster. The, <laughs> the movie is The Saint Strikes Back by RKO Studios. It re was released in March of 1939. So since this was a movie theater that was fully functioning through most of 1939, we presume, uh, why wouldn't you include that as the beginning of the period of significance? I, I would say that the, that would be the appropriate beginning of the period of significance. Um, I did not do the extra research to look up the, what was on the marquee. Um, the nomination documentation says that the, while it was begun in 1939 and the exterior seems complete, there was still interior work going on. Um, your information seems to indicate that if there was still interior work, that work is, was likely minor, um, as you pointed out, that it was sh it was showing films in 1939. Um, I think that it would be completely appropriate to update the period of significance to reflect that additional work. Okay, and I did send, send you a link to the wiki page that has the information about the Saint Strikes Back. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will, um, I will work with the authors to get a line in there to, that, that uh, justifies the new period of significance. Thank you. Right. And then secondly, um, I'm glad to see that this uh, building is coming forward. It's so intact and I'm a, generally a fan of art deco, art modern, uh, architecture. Um, and I will have a question for board member Solomonson about that. Uh, but the canopy, I was looking at the architectural drawings and they do not match the historic uh, canon or marquee that was applied. And so I'm just assuming that they did not follow the architect's uh, direction. I did notice underneath the two windows where there would be a chain, there is a small dot in the concrete. So I believe the embed that would be needed to support the larger canopy would be there. So, I guess I just generally have a question about when you are looking at an original design for a building that is so otherwise intact, and if they go off script, so to speak, um, putting a different design for a marquee, or maybe it was borrowed from another theater, who knows where it came from, 
Um, it certainly doesn't seem to match this architecture very well. Um, if they did want to replace it with something that was more appropriate, would they be allowed to look at the original drawings? That is slightly outside of my wheelhouse, and I don't think that there's staff here that could answer it more thoroughly than I can, but I would generally defer to the um, design reviewers in our office. But because there is no marquee present, um, my guess is that they would consider all of the historic documentation um, in order to design what seems to be most appropriate. Okay. They would, they would not, of course, be be required to replicate either what we see in the photograph or what we see in the drawings. So whatever came of that would be would be some sort of hybrid regardless. Right. Is there some way that we could make sure that that information is included in the in the project description that the marquee does not match the original architect's intent? Certainly, I can put that in a footnote. Great. And then my question to board member Solomonson, Art Deco or Modern? I was wondering if that might be your question actually. And uh, I, I would see it actually in a way as more modern. I mean, they, the two overlap, they overlap so much that um, and sometimes I think that uh, deco is used as the umbrella term uh, to incorporate modern. So I think it could go either way. And um, I'm curious about what what you think and uh, also board member Anderson. I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think it, it strikes me as a bit more modern only because it's stripped down more. Rather stark. And, yeah, yeah, fairly stark. It doesn't have a lot of zigzaggy line work. Um, and, but I, I also agree that I think Art Deco is generally culturally used as kind of the larger umbrella term. But, you know, I, I struggled with that in looking at this uh, because I, at first I was thinking, uh, how can we call this deco? Uh, and because it looks, I mean, it is so stark. It's so restrained. I think restrained is a really good word to, mm -hmm. to describe it. And uh, so um, to put it forward as, as a really significant example of, of art deco, I... Uh, um, I wasn't comfortable with that at first, but I am more so now I'm thinking about it as an umbrella term. Kristen, what do you think? Board member Anderson, what do you think? Um, I, I agree. I think the later date and um, the fact that it's um, kind of under a governmental umbrella in terms of the commission would argue for modern. Um, not necessarily against Art Deco, because as you suggest, it's something that people understand as this sort of common term from the 20s through the 40s. But, but if you think of buildings like Kaufman Union, for instance, it, it seems to have more in common with, with that um, appearance, restrained appearance, than with some of the, the things that are more decorative or more elegant or, or have some of the details that are um, more expensive, perhaps, um, showy kinds of things that we see from the earlier Art Deco styles. I think in, in a way, um, modern might honor the building better because it is such a modern building and it's, it's stripped down qualities and starkness. Um, so how about it? Um, I really appreciate this conversation um, and it does help us um, and me specifically to, to better understand the differences between some of these overlapping um, designs and styles. Would the board be comfortable with a, an idea that we would change Art Deco to modern? Um, if there Could is board member no... Stark jump in a sec? Absolutely. Sorry, I can only see those oh, people speaking. Sorry. Please, yeah. Um, it, my comment would be, I, I like the fact you call it Stark. Stark, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, sort of, and it's a very simple, very elegant building. It's very simple. But um, 
kind of, we're talking academically here uh, about the style of the building, but what does the community see it as? Do they have a specific thing? Do they, you know, if we change it on them is, it, it, since it can go either way, I would go with whatever the community's called it. If they haven't called it anything, if it's modern uh, art deco or modern, just my thought on that. Do we have anyone from the community that can speak to that? Or uh, Jamie, are you? I think I saw that you put a comment in the comment section. Um, is are you? Can you speak to that? Sure. I hope you can hear me. Um, I can. The, the community didn't voice any particular, um, I guess, preference of of one term over the other. So um, obviously, not not being a member of of Sherburn, um, I, I couldn't speak with a, a lot of certainty. Um, if this is a matter that should be brought to their attention, however, I am more than happy to to have that conversation with the community to see if um, that preference of of say Art Deco over mo modern um, would be more appropriate from their point of view. I'm just going to, I guess I'm the disruptor on this one, um, but I'm going to add a little bit more information because there were some details of the upper outside corners of the building towards the parapet um, where they are slightly chamfered, which reminded me of the Minneapolis downtown post office, which according to, again, the Wikipedia entry, I know this is not like hard scholarship, um, but they refer to it as PWA modern art deco style. So you get the whole family in there. All of them. And uh, we have seen it in nominations kind of waffle between the two, certainly. Um, my only concern is I don't have the multiple property documentation form in front of me. Um, I would need to reference the, the property, the documentation form to see if they are specific if they specifically call the style um, art deco. If they don't, I am happy to insert modern um, and have the whole suite or switch it to modern. I appreciate board member St Stark's perspective, um, but we do, uh, if the community doesn't feel strongly one way or the other, um, I would say that the we have a responsibility to make sure that it's academically accurate. That is our, our role here. Um, I would, of course, be willing and able to, to accommodate any strong feelings on behalf of the community, but since there seem to be none. Jenny, do you know offhand what the, uh, this is board member Anderson, do you know offhand what the, um, the drop down menu, what the, the National Register form offers as, as the, the array of choices within this. I was, I was, I was afraid you might ask that. Um, Sorry, I was just trying to look it up over here. I'm not looking at Twitter or anything. I'm no. I've got a national register thing going on on my. Extra I'm never going to do this presentation look. with one screen ever again. I also yeah, cannot nice look it up real quick. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, one of my colleagues um, who Googles that fairly often can can pull it up for us. I believe that it does have um, that the. Both the modern and the art deco are both subsets of modern architecture, if I am, if I recall correctly. Um, so I think they are, they are. I know that they are both options. I do not believe that that modern is is a subset of art deco. I believe they are independent of each other. Thank you. Board I don't believe there's any again. technical reason why we can't why we can't switch it um, to modern if the if the board feels. Um, more comfortable with that and Jamie having uh, one of our authors having done the research also feels comfortable with it. And I'm not necessarily pushing that it has to be uh, switched to modern, but I think if there was a conversation within the nomination that talked about where it sat on the spectrum from Art Deco to modern, that might okay. be helpful. Um, I'm, I'm basing my my suggestion to change it um, some, on something that a board member Solomonson said. She said that at first she felt uncomfortable putting this forward as a as an Art Deco style building eligible under Criterion C um, if it would make if we if if board member Solomonson not to put you on the spot but if you've come to terms with that under Art Deco then um, I'm really I'm open to suggestion here and um I'm more comfortable with modern, and uh, I, I, I think 
I mean, I, the way I put it earlier, I think is it, it, it honors the building or describes the building um, more fully and it relates it to other buildings, uh, other, other buildings of its era. Um, uh, board members, Sir Anderson, board members, Sinkowski, are you and other board members, do you, does everyone feel like that? I would defer to uh, board member Solomonson. She hands out the grades. <laughs> She's on sabbatical. She's not handing out any grades right now. Oh. <laughs> Falls to you then, board member Anderson. I say modern. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Jenny I think is, board member Stark had something and uh, it looks like Dennis yeah. is speaking up. I, I really, this is board member Stark. I really do like this building. It seems elegant and fits into this community and it hasn't changed. And it seems like it's really served a good purpose, which is beautiful. Uh, I do have a question about the ending date on the period of significance. It wasn't really clear. Mm -hmm. And why was it 1971 besides Led Zeppelin had some great music then? That was it. No, I'm the, <laughs> the 50 year rule, the 50 year guideline for the uh, National Park Service that, okay. uh, without once we go into. 49 years of significance or less, it we begin to have to discuss exceptional significance, which was not put forth in the MPDF. So, at this point, the period of significance would roll until 1990. That makes sense. Um, Thank you. Certainly. Dennis, Dennis did you have did a clarification something? on the technical? Uh, yeah, Jenny, I just wanted to let you know to, to answer uh, uh, Chair Anderson's question, you know, our pull down menu, um, we actually have, uh, we actually have 2 entries. It's modern movement modern. Perfect. Thanks for checking that. And this is Amy Spong. I just wanted to point out that board member Lavasser has had her hand raised. Patiently. Thank you. <laughs> Board member Lavasser, are you ready to go? Um, actually, I had it raised before and I crossed it off in one place, but it's still raised in another place. So I don't have anything more to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. I can lower the hand. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Uh, this is board member Warner, and I just wanted to point out a couple of um, things that I very much appreciated about this nomination. One was the tables that were put in that kind of show, you know, here's where it started and here's where it is now. Loved that. Um, and also I appreciated within the discussion of the history, the pre Martin County history as well. And I noted that in another um, uh, nomination within what we read tonight or for tonight. And, uh, and, and I like to see that, um, that there was a nod to what has happened before. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Are we ready to vote? Can someone make a motion? I would make a motion that we forward this to the National Park Service for nomination. Board member Koski moves the vote. Is there a second? Second. That board was member board member Decker. Decker. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? All right. Board member Anderson votes aye. Board member Decker. Aye. Board member Dyer. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Koski. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Schulke. Aye. Board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. Board member Warner. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> and we're on to Wyndham Park Historic District in Winona. And this is Dennis presented for us. Hey, John, have you uh, turned it over to me? Yes, Dennis, you should have your uh, presentation rolled out. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, this is uh, the Wyndham Park Residential Historic District. It's in Winona, Winona County. Uh, the authors are Aaron Q uh, with Salem Miller from the 106 group. And Aaron, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. Sorry about that. The Wyndham Park Residential Historic District is a district of houses surrounding a park square. It is composed of many high style residences and was home to some of the earliest families in Winona that helped to build the city into a commercial success. And here we're viewing the Italian villa style Huff Lamberton house, and we are looking to the Northwest. As noted, the Wyndham Park Residential Historic District is located in Winona, Winona County in southeastern Minnesota. We can see it here outlined in black. It is located near the city's commercial core, which is just to the east. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but uh, you know we've got roughly a square shaped uh, uh, outline at the center of uh, the at the center of Winona. This is a closer view of the district. The district is outlined by the green and black border. The park square is near the center of the district. The residences that make up the district are an eclectic mix of architectural styles from Italian Villa to Italian Eight, Second Empire, Queen Anne, Colonial Revival, Tudor Revival to Mission slash Spanish Colonial Revival. At left is the Colonial Revival style Samuel L. and Maud Laird Prentice House, and we are facing southeast. And at the right is the Italian style, or excuse me, the Italian Eight style. Jerome G. Swarthouse, and there we are facing southeast. At left is the colonial revival style Charles M. and Gracie Humans House. There we are facing west. And at right is the Queen Anne style Peter and Edna Hallenbeck House. And there we are facing north. At lower left is the Queen Anne style Abner F. Hodgson's house. Uh, and we are looking to the Northwest. And then at top right is the Queen Anne style Frederick S. and Francis L. Bell house. And there we are facing Northwest. The homes in the residential district surround Wyndham Park. One entire block of open space with diagonal walkways and a fountain punctuating its center. Those walkways retain their early alignment today. The park was initially named First Ward Park because it was within the city's first ward. It was also referenced as Wyndham Square in some 1850s town plats. The land for the park was originally owned by prominent citizen Henry Huff a land developer and real estate agent who built his impressive, impressive Italian villa style home nearby in 1857, which makes it the oldest residence in the area. However, in 1863, the city of Winona brought a lawsuit against Huff after he denied that he initially planned to donate the land to the city for use as a park. The case ultimately was resolved and the land became a city park and a magnet for the location of prominent family residences. In this photograph, our view is southwest across the park. As earlier noted, the families that occupied the residences in the Wyndham Park area were largely well-to-do as they were the commercial and industrial leaders that developed the city into a financial success. It was something of a closed community as these families participated in an elite social circle. It was not unusual for children of the families in the Wyndham Park neighborhood to marry, drawing these families closer together. Many owners lived in their residences until passing away, oftentimes leaving their house to the children. And at upper left is a circa 1890 photograph of the Frederick S. and Francis L. Bell House. 
The middle image is circa 1965 and depicts the Abner F. Hodgson's house. And then the photograph at bottom right is circa 1963 and shows the Herman E. and Mary Curtis house. The period of significance is 1857 to 1938. The level of significance is local. National register criteria is A and C. The areas of significance, social history and architecture. The period of significance begins in 1857 with construction of the first major residence, the Huff Lamberton House, and ends in 1938 with the redevelopment of the W.H. Laird Estate. It is a period that covers the construction of all buildings within the district representing this distinctive high style architecture. Reflecting an array of impressive architectural styles, the Wyndham Park Residential Historic District is perhaps one of the most impressive residential districts in Minnesota. It is an area of Winona near the downtown core. Families that existed within the same social circle, one of prominence and power. In its heyday, it was essentially an independent community within this larger community of Winona. It was a different, unique community that most in the city never would experience. Because of its uniqueness in both architecture and social history, the Wyndham Park Residential Historic District is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, I just want to say that we have one uh, we have one piece of correspondence for this property uh, from a Mr. William Miller. He objects to his property at 276 Fifth Street being listed in the National Register. The correspondence is dated August 6, 2021. Thanks, Dennis. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address this nomination? I can only see hands for about half the group. I don't see any. Uh, okay, board members, your turn. Any comments or questions? Uh, Chair Anderson? Yes. We do have a Preston Lam Lamwing with, with their hand raised. Excellent. Go ahead. Yes, I just want to thank uh, the state historic preservation uh, office and the Winona County heritage preservation and Winona County staff for all of the work they've done to pull this together. I, we own one of the houses on Wyndham Park um, it was built in 1880 originally. So uh, it was one of the bankers homes. So uh, just it's uh, exciting to think about the opportunity to be on the register. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank Thanks you. for the comment. I have a question um, to the, the man that just spoke. What's with Mr. Miller? That was board member Decker. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I believe he's a, a landlord um, that owns a lot of properties around and was, if it's my, if my understanding is correct, probably just didn't want to have to deal with what potentially in his mind might be Hassles uh, being a part of a national register. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Looks like a great neighborhood. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Uh, this is board member Warner. I'm wondering if this is already designated as a local historic district. And then when you have somebody who objects when it's in a larger district, how does the state review board, how do we handle that within the nomination? Uh, well, uh, board member um, Warner, um, you know, the, you know, the his correspondence will become part of the historical record, but you know, in order for a district not to be listed, you know, we have to have a majority of owners that object to it. So, um, and we don't have that here. Thank you, Dennis. Oh, you know, the other, the other thing, board member Warner, um, I'm not sure if this is locally designated or not. It, it very well may be. Uh, Luke, are you there? 
I am here, Dennis, and I can speak to that. Uh, this district was, in fact, locally designated in 2016. Uh, there is one slight adjustment related to that. The First Baptist Church is not included. And I can also speak to Mr. Miller and his um, opposition to this. Mr. Miller attempted to demolish the Drew House uh, two years ago and was rebuffed by the Winona Heritage Preservation Commission and failed to complete his appeal to the City Council. Thank you, Luke. Dennis, this is Amy. I was just going to add a little bit more about the objection process. Uh, the, sure. the handouts and the, the park service rules state that um, they, you know, properties may have multiple owners. So you're, you are, if you have an objection, you're, you're supposed to indicate if you are, uh, if you have partial ownership or full ownership in an individual property, but it doesn't necessarily matter because everybody, whether you're a partial or a full owner of a property in a proposed historic district, everybody gets one, one objection or one, one vote to support it. And then it's the, it's the majority of the property owners need to approve or support the, um, the nomination. And um, because the, the state review board is an advisory and they're making recommendations, if they're not making a final answer that is um, at the park service level, um, if we do receive a letter of objection after the state review board meeting, we will forward that on to the National Park Service. And so um, up until the time that the Park Service takes action on the nomination, objections can go forward. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Other comments or questions? Are we ready for a motion? This is board member Warner. I move that we mm -hmm. um, send this on to the National Register. This is board member Solomonson. I very happily second that nomination. Thanks. We have a nomination and a second. Is there any other discussion or questions before we vote? Um, this is board member Warner. I just had one more comment. Um, something that I appreciated about uh, this nomination is the amount of uh, research that went into researching all of these homes. This is going to be um, a wonderful resource for the people who end up owning these homes in the future. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, board member Anderson votes yes. Board member Decker? Aye. Board member Dyer? Aye. Board member James? Aye. Board member Koski? Aye. Board member Lavasser? Aye. Board member Mann? Aye. Board member Schulke? Yes, aye. Board member Solomonson? Aye. Board member Stark? Aye. Board member Warner? Aye. Okay, thanks everybody. And next we are on to another commercial or historic district, the Excelsior Commercial Historic District in Excelsior, Hennepin County. And we have Dennis again. Yep, this is uh, the Excelsior Commercial Historic District. Excelsior, Hennepin County. The author is Rachel Peterson of Hess Royce and Company. The Excelsior Commercial Historic District is a collection of commercial buildings reflecting the early period of Excelsior's commercial development. It is not a large district, but then Excelsior never had a large downtown. And here at left is a photo of the Welter Building, and we are looking to the east. And at right is the Miller Block. Our view there is to the west. This is a map that depicts the boundary of the district, which is highlighted in blue. And as you can see, it, it again, it's not terribly large. We again see the boundary of the district highlighted in blue on this Google Earth, Google Earth aerial. Excelsior is just to the west of Minneapolis and is adjacent to Lake Minnetonka. 
one of the more popular lakes in Minnesota. Parts of the lake are seen to the northeast and the northwest. Specifically, the section to the northeast is Excelsior Bay, and that part to the northwest is uh, Gideon Bay. The Excelsior Commercial Historic District is a mix of various styles, including Renaissance Revival, Romanesque Revival, Georgian Revival, and Modern. At left is the Minnetonka State Bank, and there we are looking to the northwest. And at right is the Sampson Building, and we are facing southwest. At lower left is the Excelsior Masonic Temple. Our view there is to the southeast. And at upper right is the Apgar Building. The view there is to the west. Here we have a couple more examples of buildings in the district. At left is the Welter building. Um, regrettably, I didn't realize I had already used that one. Um, but so we're seeing it a second time and the view there is to the east. And at right is the Oddfellows Temple or and, slash Morse Dry Goods building. The view is to the southwest. If I may quote the National Register nomination, quote, the Excelsior Commercial Historic District exemplifies the city's vibrant commercial development, beginning with its origins as a tourist town for Lake Minnetonka vacationers and continuing through its redevelopment as a suburb of Minneapolis in the mid 20th century, unquote. Excelsior was the vibrant commercial center on Lake Minnetonka. While tourism was the driving economic, economic force early on, eventually it gave way and Excelsior had to turn to other industries, such as restaurants, entertainment venues, and auto sales. We got a couple of additional historic images. At left is an image from 1959, and at right is a photo from 1967. Our period of significance is 1886 to 1955. The level of significance is local. The National Register criterion is A, and the area of significance is commerce. The period of significance begins in 1886 when the earliest building was constructed and ends in 1955 when the downtown had been fully developed. The downtown historic district represents Excelsior's early commercial history. Most of the buildings were built in the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Excelsior began as a tourist destination on Lake Minnetonka, but eventually tourism fell off. And new entertainment venues were developed as well as auto sales. But this district continues to reflect its early history. And as such, it is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, we actually have a few pieces of correspondence for this district. Uh, two pieces of correspondence are objections from owners in the district. One objection is from Mr. John Raskin. He owns the building at 218 228 Water Street in Excelsior. His letter is dated June 21st, 2021 and he does not wish for his building to be a part of the district. Additionally, we have an objection from the owner, owners of 35 Water Street. The owners are Jan Nigren and John Nigren. Their letter is dated July 27th, 2021. And they also do not want their building to be a part of the historic district. And this building is actually a non-contributing building. We also have two pieces of correspondence supporting the nomination of downtown Excelsior into the National Register. One piece of correspondence is from Tim Karen and is dated August 9th, 2021. He is the owner of uh, Bullen's General Store at 223-227 Water Street, as well as the commercial building at 254-256 Water Street. He strongly supports the nomination. And we also have received a letter from the Excelsior Heritage Preservation Commission dated August 9th, 2021. 
and they strongly support the nomination of the historic district as well. Thanks, Dennis. My dog is also very appreciative, as you can hear. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyone want to speak to this uh, nomination? Any comments from guests, audience? And again, my ability to see your raised hand is kind of limited, but. Chris Dennis. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm actually working with Nigrans. Um, the, you're missing one letter regarding 409 2nd Street. They also submitted a letter to not be included on that building as well. That was mailed via postal mail. So okay. I do have a copy of that for an objection on that building as well. That one is a contributing building. Okay. Thank you. I can get you a copy of that. And um, so just to bring that up. Um, and, uh, I have one question. I one other question. I'm in the process of purchasing those buildings from the Nigrans, the 35 Water and the 409 Second. Mm -hmm. um, with the 35 Water Street building being a non-contributing member or non-contributing building, to the what does that what does that mean going forward? If the uh, you know if it's recognized nationally, what does that mean that that building was then excluded? Um, or what, what would that mean going no, forward? Uh, Mr. Dennis, it's technically, it still is, it's still technically within the district. Um, it's just listed as non-contributing. Um, the big difference between a contributing and non-contributing building is that a contributing building qualifies for tax credits uh, and the non-contributing buildings do not. So, you know, uh, if you end up purchasing, you know, that, that one contributing building that you mentioned, uh, you'll qualify for a 20% state tax credit and a 20% federal tax credit. And so if you rehabilitate your building, uh, depending on how large the project is, it can be a pretty big offset at cost. Yeah, that is the plan. I'm planning on um, going in front of the you know, Excelsior um, Heritage Preservation Committee next week, at least with the preliminary plan to start replacing some windows upstairs and mm -hmm. doing some tuck pointing and doing some other things on the building. So um, well, when would those things, when did those tax credits take effect then? We would have to, we would have to, actually, the, you know, what you'll want to do is contact one of our design reviewers. Is it possible for you to send me an email so I have your email address? Yeah. So I can send, uh, I can give, give you the names of those design reviewers. You know, Perfect. and you can call either one of them and they're going to be able to give you more information on the tax credits. Okay. And since, you know, the, the building is going to be contributing and in the district, um, fairly soon here, you know, once the National Park Service looks at it, um, you should be able to, to to start work on it fairly quickly, but you, you definitely want to get those tax credits. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I will just add, this is Amy Spong. I will just add that the, the review that you referenced of going in front of the local Heritage Preservation Commission, that's a separate design review process that you will go through based on the local designation status. The, the national register status does not change that process at all. Um, and you would only be going through review for our office if you were applying to get historic tax credits. Okay. I hope that helps. And if I was not looking for tax credits then that review process does not. That's but correct. You'd just be going in front of the H the Heritage Preservation Commission on that local level. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. And Thanks. and there is a there is a we have a kind of a frequently asked questions. You probably didn't get that because you are um, not a not a property owner yet in the district, but we can probably send out some additional materials on just what National Register um, means, um, the listing means for you. Yep, absolutely. So when you send me that email, I'll make sure to 
to include the, uh, the frequently asked questions. And your, where would I get your email from? Uh, would you put it in the chat or? Oh, oh, sure. Um, you know, it's. Uh, uh, can I, you, do you I'll put it in the chat. I'll, I'll put oh, it in the oh, chat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, yep. Amy. Yep. No problem. Other comments or questions about this nomination? Uh, yes, board member James. So I, it's kind of related to the previous 1 about, uh, owners objecting, um, because there are 32 contributing properties for this nomination and Excelsior. Um, does that mean that 17 property owners need to approve or, um, object? For anything for 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 us not to move forward with this, I I, I got I know um, confused about that. Yes, uh, board member uh, James, um, we need a majority to object. Okay, so even if it was a fifty fifty split, that's not a majority. You know, so we need that majority to to actually object. Okay, and and it looks like a majority has not objected. No, in this case. no. Okay, thank you. Thanks I'll I'll question. just add to that if we did have a a majority of objections, we the SHPO office is still able to forward those to the National Park Service for a determination of eligibility. It just wouldn't move. It just wouldn't move forward with finalist yeah. nomination. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, uh, what, what Amy's mentioning there is what's called a determination of eligibility. In other words, uh, the keeper of the national register, you know, would look at the nomination and make a determination as to whether or not the nomination was eligible for listing in the national register, but she couldn't actually list it. We, but we would have that determination of eligibility. And the reason we have that is in case, you know, you know, later on owners, you know, a, a majority of owners did not object, then we could place it right in the national register and not go back through, you know, the, this whole review process. Anything else, other questions or comments? This is board member Koski. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, regarding the theater building, which um, I know is the Dock Theater, and here it's described as the Tonka Theater, is that the same theater? Oh, I, I you know, Board Member Koski, you, you may be right because I think there's only one theater that's that's listed, or excuse me, that's within the district. Okay, so it it uh, so are. are did you look up the historic name? Was was that the historic name that you mentioned? Well, I've seen movies there, <laughs> um, and I just looked it up on Google. It's at, at least it looks like it's called the Doc Cinema. Um, it could have received a more recent change in name. My question, though, is related to whether or not the building itself was purpose built as a theater. Sometimes there were conversions of other performance venues into movie theaters, and then the exterior were exteriors were modernized um, sure. when they made that transition. So I'm just wondering about the deeper history on that particular building. Um, and I know that the boards on the ground floor are not Liebenberg and Kaplan, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but. <laughs> You know what? What is the longer history of the of the history of that building? Uh, Rachel, would you are you here? Would you be able to answer that question? I'm here. I can, to the best of my memory, here. It was purpose built as a theater. Um, the exact date escapes me, and I don't have my notes super handy right here. But um, yeah, it was a Liebenberg Kaplan design. There's another building actually further up the street um, that was historically uh, uh, like. Um, cabaret kind of theater that was renovated and now it's um, a restaurant. Um, so there was that kind of 
activity in this district as well, but the, the Tonka Theater, now the Dock Theater, um, which was renovated later to get its nautical theme. So I think that's where the Dock name came from, um, was purpose built as a theater. Right. So I guess my question is if we could add some more to the description of that particular property in case a future owner or this owner wants to uh, restore the exterior of the building, the only reference that we have in, in the write-up is related to like 1971 or whatever that was converted. Rachel, could, is it possible for you to do that? Yeah, I think I can handle that pretty easily. Yep. Yeah, okay. if we just cite the original construction of the building, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. It does show up in the section on the modern era uh, in the narrative rather than in a specific description of the building. So maybe something there as well, tie it together. Sure. Um, Chairman, or excuse me, uh, board member Koski, um, can you send me your notes? You know, just just so I can remember. <laughs> just I'm getting old. <laughs> just so I can remember. Uh, uh, no to problem. Address everything. I'll, I'll shoot you a quick email. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, Bernard Bernard Stark. Stark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I and Dennis, I sent to a young Dennis some my notes <laughs> yesterday because I know you also forget as a young man. Um, <laughs> The, I, I love Excelsior downtown and driving down this. It's it making putting this district on the register is going to help protect the character of the neighborhood. And the, I think the whole community feels very strongly about uh, maintaining that small area. If I'm in the area, I stop by and swing by or get off my motorcycle or car and walk down the street. It's wonderful. Um, and I know the just the date of significance goes to 1955. So I couldn't confirm that Mr. Jimmy actually met Mick, Jick, um, Mick Jagger in the Red Owl store or whatever it was, the drugstore at that time. Um, the, the question though, and, and Rachel, nice job on writing this too. The buildings weren't all specifically gone into detail, but there was mention at the Masonic Temple and the Odd Fellows Club that those were prominent distinctive buildings and they mentioned the odd fellows in detail but the masonic lodge seemed to have gotten lost in the wayside there and it'd be nice to see just a little more information on that side too so that would be my only comments on this okay thank you other comments or questions are we ready for a motion I'd like to make a motion, does board member Stark to nominate this to the register, the district? Thank you, is there a second? This is board member Warner, I will second. Thanks, Mary. Any other discussion before we vote? All right, board member Anderson says yes. Board member Decker. Aye. Board member Dyer. Aye. Board Member James? Aye. Board Member Koski? Aye. Board Member Lavasser? Aye. Board Member Mann? Aye. Board Member Schulke? Aye. Board Member Solomonson? Aye. Board Member Stark? Aye. Board Member Warner? Aye. And now that we've done the, the uh, roll call for the vote, I made a note for myself that Amy had asked that we turn our cameras on for votes. So next time, right? I'll try to remind you next time. Thanks everybody. That's encouragement. <laughs> it's a great idea. Although I did see an article not too long ago about how um, the difference in energy efficiency in these online mm -hmm. meetings was yeah. dramatically increased if the cameras were off. Uh, so it evidently yeah. uses a lot of energy. Yeah. But when you're voting, and we're also dealing with Zoom fatigue. <laughs> there's real. that. Yeah, there's that. All right, we're on to Minnehaha at its winter home at 140 George Street in Excelsior again. And uh, Ginny, have you had enough time to figure out or memorize your text? Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go, and I think I have it's solved looking the good. problem. Yep. 
I have to navigate two screens, so you may still have to bear with me a little bit, and I appreciate your patience. So we are still in Excelsior in Hennepin County. We're talking about the Minnehaha, which is a steamboat that is um, illustrate, illustrative of the tourism and recreation uh, that Dennis was just discussing um, his, in his presentation on the district. The nomination was written by Lindsay Hanna of Row 10 Historic Preservation Solutions, LLC. Designed by Royal Seymour, Minnehaha <clears throat> is a wooden hulled steamboat with a distinctive canary yellow exterior modeled after early 20th century streetcars operated by the Twin City Rapid Transit Company. According to the nomination, quote, the steamboat Minnehaha is 70, 70 feet in overall length with a 14 feet 10 inch beam, draft of 5 feet 7.5 inches with ballast, and displacement of 110,000 pounds with ballast. The boat has a launch style hull and torpedo stern, end quote. Lake Minnetonka, located 15 miles west southwest of Minneapolis, became a vacation spot in the late 19th century. Efforts to make Lake Minnetonka the, quote, Saratoga of the West, unquote, modeled after the obscure resorts of Saratoga Springs in New York, began in earnest in the late 1870s. In 1881, in the 1881 summer season, 10,000 guests were expected to visit the various lodgings on the lakefront and take advantage of views of the lake, fine dining, and entertainment. Here we see the winter home of the Minnehaha, both in a um, scaled out to see the city of Excelsior, as well as um, highlighted in red on the right. Founded in 1891, the Twin Cities Rapid Transit Company initially focused on building and running the electric streetcar system within Minneapolis and St. Paul. Thomas Lowry as president and Calvin Goodrich as general manager developed a plan to boost ridership and encourage recreational trips on the streetcar system. This included expanding its reach through expanding lines to the west and linking Lake Minnetonka to the Twin Cities. At left, we see the port side of Minnehaha near the bow, camera facing south. At center is a view from the bow towards the cabin, camera pointed north uh, southwest. At right, we see the starboard side of Minnehaha near the bow, camera pointed north. To further expand its ridership, the, twin, the transit company stretched its streetcar service into Lake Minnetonka by creating aquatic routes for streetcar boats that began near the end of the streetcar line in Excelsior. The goal was to provide seasonal scheduled service from docks in Excel, Excelsior to other Lake Minnetonka communities, allowing passengers to seam, seamlessly transition between boat travel on the lake and streetcar travel to and from the Twin Cities. In 1905, the transit company retained Royal Seymour to build six identical streetcar boats. The design was explicitly modeled after the Twin Cities Rapid Transit streetcars to provide a uniform appearance and visually link the cars and boats as one transportation network. Minnehaha and her sister boats each carried a pilot, engineer, and a purser, along with 125 to 150 passengers, which allowed each boat to hold the passengers of three streetcars. Minnehaha and her sister boats launched in 1906 and made stops at public and private docks, allowing those with lakefront property to commute to Minneapolis and visitors to spend a summer day on the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Streetcars ran every half hour to Excelsior, to Excelsior but during su busy summer weekends, they headed out to the Lake Minnetonka every 10 minutes. On the left is a photo of, of the midship of the cabin on the port side, camera pointed southeast, and at right, is roughly the same side of the ship, uh, the boat circa 1915. You have to look past these nice gentlemen standing there. <clears throat> Here we see a photo of the Minnehaha in circa 1910 and a current photo of the midship of the cabin on the starboard side, camera pointing northwest. Initially, Minnehaha and her sister boats called express boats or yellow jackets due to their distinctive canary yellow exterior paint, all routed through from Excelsior to Tonka Bay and Deep Haven to various points across Lake Minnetonka, including Wyzetta, Zimbretta Heights, and Spring Park. At left is the starboard side of the stern, camera pointed north, 
At right is the propeller at stern with the rudder temporarily removed for repairs. Camera pointed north. Starting in 1908, three boats were dedicated to the lower lake, providing service out of Excelsior, and three boats operated in the upper lake, providing service out of Wildhurst. At left is a view of the interior of the cabin towards the bow, camera pointed northeast. At right, we see an example of the lower window sash sliding into, hold on, sliding into a hold on, star, on the starboard side of the cabin, camera pointed south. For the first 10 years of operation, ridership on the boats alone exceeded 200,000 people in the season, in a season that roughly lasted four months. Ridership dipped during World War I, recovered after the war, and then began a general decline. Roughly 108,000 passengers traveled on the boats in 1923. At right, we see a, I'm sorry, at left, we see a view of the, the wheel, um, camera pit, pointed northeast. At center is a view of the engine, camera pointed northwest. And at right is a view of the seating inside the cabin, camera pointed north. <clears throat> Here are two views of the upper level. On the left is a view of the upper cabin looking toward the bow, camera pointed northeast. On the right is a view of the benches at the rear of the upper level, camera pointed north. As automobiles increased in popularity and availability, the streetcar boats saw fewer and fewer passengers. In 1926, Minnehaha and two other boats were stripped of anything usable, towed out to Lake Minnetonka just north of Big Island, and scuttled. Shortly thereafter, the additional streetcar boats were scrapped, except for Hopkins. She was sold to a private owner and eventually scuttled in 1949. At right, we see a view of the ladder to the upper left to the upper level of the cabin, camera pointed west. At left is roughly the same view, circa 1906. After being located by a diver, the hull of Minnehaha was raised from the lake bed in 1980. Thanks to a volunteer workforce, refurbishment of the steamboat began in 1990. In 1996, the Minnehaha was successfully relaunched. Here we see views of the raising on the right and refurbishment efforts on the left. The period of significance for, uh, for the Minnehaha is 1906 to 1926. The level of significance is local. National Register Criterion A. Areas of significance are transportation and entertainment and recreation. The period of significance begins with when the Minnehaha launched and continues through the year she was scuttled. Constructed in 1906, salvaged in 1980, refurbished starting in 1990 and relaunched in 1996, the steamboat Minnehaha is the only extant streetcar boat on Lake Minnetonka. Although only historically active for 20 years, the distinctive steamboats ferried thousands of residents and visitors across the lake and helped define transportation and recreation for riders during their use. For these reasons, the Minnehaha is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. We have one piece of correspondence related to this property. In a letter dated August 9, 2021, Tim Curran, acting chair of the Historic Preservation Commission in Excelsior, writes that the HPC, quote, supports the consideration of the Minnehaha's placement on the National Register as a significant historical object and a familiar, visible feature in Lake Minnetonka area. End quote. Thanks, Jenny. You're welcome. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address this nomination? Did you see any hands up anywhere? Anybody want to jump in? Yes, we have a Aaron person. Hello. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hi, yeah, my name is Aaron person. I am the uh, historian figure for the Museum of Lake Minnetonka, which is the, the organization that owns the Minnehaha and has owned it since um, 2004, 2003, 2004. Um, I'm also happen to be one of the captains of the Minnehaha as well. Um, I just want to say um, that the, the Minnehaha is kind of one of those situations that uh, you know, we've seen in other places in the state and the country where it's such an icon for the community and really the uh, Lake Minnetonka area um, that many people that we uh, got inquiries about, um, just many people around the area seem to think that the Minnehaha 
has already been listed on the National Register, even though it has not. Um, so it is uh, clearly such an iconic uh, fixture of the community. And uh, we've always treated it as a historic resource and as a basically a floating museum. So with that, um, I would uh, say that we welcome a strong green vote from members and thank you for your consideration. Thanks, Aaron. Any other comments or questions? Also board members, anybody want to jump in? This board is board Stark. member Warner. Oops. Board member Warner, go ahead first, and then we'll have board <laughs> member Stark. Uh, uh, sort of a technical question. Um, I see that category of property is listed as structure instead of object. So what is the difference between structure and object in terms of National Register? A structure is a building, is it is an object or a, <laughs> see? A structure <laughs> is something that was not built for human human habitation, but does in fact hold humans at some point. So we structures are often also considered barns and sheds. Um, an object is typically considered an artistic piece, like um, like a stat like a statue or those pieces that are easily movable sometimes is how you could think of those are parts of a landscape. So in the case of a boat, while it is both an object and a structure, the National Register would consider it a structure because it can in fact hold and transport humans. Thanks, Jenny. Sure. Board Member Stark and then Board Member James next. Go ahead, John. You're muted, I think. John Stark. There you go. Can anyone hear John Stark or is it just me having trouble? I cannot hear him either. John, try again. Oh no. Is your headset unplugged? Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Question ties in along with that same thing is the it, it's a boat and it's movable it doesn't have a point of significance but should it, it ever move off of lake minnetonka would it still maintain its historic designation and i think we've looked at that with tugboats that have moved and different things like that too yes so much like something listed for its architecture the the boat itself is what is eligible so if it were going were to go into you know consistent dry dock or something like that we would take a look at its setting um and see whether or not that that permanent move affects the negatively affects the integrity of setting feeling and association primarily because of course it's design um, and materials would move with it okay and we would see if it, it negatively affected it enough that it would need to be delisted um we did deal with that um, on something in Lake Superior when we talked about moving a tugboat into permanent dry dock, um, and we were discussing where where that might be most appropriate. Um, and of course, near the water is always preferable. In this case, it does have a winter home and then is usable on the lake. So that small move is not something the National Park Service nece is necessarily concerned with because when it is functioning, it is primarily um, it is clearly within its um, setting and so feeling and association are, are very much evident. And then when it's in dry dock, that has to do with the winter conditions more than the than a permanent settlement. So if okay. it were moved, Thank, yeah. we would address it um, just as we would a moved building. That makes sense. And then my second part of this question is: um, it's a beautiful restoration, and very accurate, and brought it up to date. And it, it, I really love that. It's much like a classic car that's been missing a lot of parts. And you say it's a full restoration in that. Um, just the integrity of the, the question, I guess, is the the amount of the original structure, the hull that was there. Is there a point where this wouldn't be eligible had it not had as much of the original hull or anything left? And I think with buildings, it's less than 50% is kind of when you consider it that way. Um, with boats, it's an interesting question, and, and I did talk to my colleagues both in the office and out of the office at National Park Service when we were discussing this. Um, unlike buildings, a boat 
is expected to have material replacement as it is used okay. throughout its life. Um, so the historic material, integrity of material is not thought of quite in the same way. Um, it's about the discussion of a replacement in kind as opposed to original historic material. Um, so because the restoration was accurate in both material type where available as well as design, um, we consider the integrity of this of this property to be fairly high. Oh, understanding that it's not the wood that was was in, the boat was initially constructed with, frankly, after 20 years of use, probably what was what was there in 1926 wasn't what was there uh, in 1906 anyway. Um, it is unique to this particular type of property um, and all those properties that go through continual refurbishment through their through their active life. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Board member <clears throat> James, you have a question? Hi, everybody. I have uh, two questions, uh, but first a comment. I really enjoyed reading this nomination. Um, I'm a historian of transport. I was born and raised in New York City. I moved to Minnesota in 2000. So learning about this really blew my mind. So I really appreciate that. Um, so my two comments, my two questions are, um, is the shed on 140 George Street also going to be preserved with this? Um, and my other question is, how common is it for boats rail cars and cars to be preserved by the National Register? Um, the, the shed itself is not part of the, this particular boundary, listing boundary. Um, if we wanted to include the shed, we would need to support that, um, that structure's significance um, specifically. Um, and because the transportation aspect and the entertainment and recreation aspect did not necessarily include the winter home um, as the primary reason for its significance. Um, at this point, I would be interested to see what information we could we could accumulate to support that. But at this point, we haven't we haven't yet justified that. Um, and I can't give you necessarily statistics on the how many movable objects, um, movable transportation objects are listed in the National Register. Um, I know the state of Minnesota has a number of them, um, but I couldn't off the top of my head provide that statistical analysis for you. If you are interested in that, we can certainly um, reach out to uh, Jim Krumrai, our cultural resource information manager and ask him to run, uh, run some queries through the database. We'd be happy to give you that kind of information. If it's possible, I would love it. Sure, um, I'll make a note. And thank you for answering my questions. You're more than welcome. Other questions? We or can comments? also maybe do a. Oh, this is Amy. I was just going to suggest too. We could include shipwrecks because that's mm -hmm. another resource that we recognize as well. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Any other comments or questions from the board? Hey, oh, sorry, board member Solomonson. Uh, I just want to second what um, board member James said about this being a fascinating nomination. I was really happy to see it. It's a good story too, and it was really well told. I look forward to getting out there before the summer's over. This is board member Koski. Um, I mostly appreciate um, learning the proper use of the nautical term scuttle. And um, I would like to move uh, that this be uh, forwarded to the National Park Re for a uh, listing on the National Register. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Board Member Schulke, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, board Member Stark. Is the um, is the boat on the water now, and are there rides, or do we have to wait till next year? Aaron, can you answer that for us? Is that a yes and Hi, yes? Um, yeah, the go ahead. Minnehaha is currently out of the water, 
Um, sure. It's a uh, real estate issue with the launch ramp, but uh, she is currently being maintained and being kept ship shaped so that she can be returned to the water as soon as possible. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions before we vote? Any other questions before you turn your cameras on as you're able so that we can vote? Because this is what makes, makes it a public meeting, right? Okay, board member Anderson. I say aye. Aye, aye. Let's have this. <laughs> board member Decker. Board member Decker. We'll come back to you. Board member Dyer. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Koski. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Schulke. Aye. Board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye, aye. Board member Warner. Aye. And board member Decker, are you with us? Okay, well, regardless of what board member Decker would have to say, I think it passes. Thank you very board, much. Board member Decker, if you are, if you're having trouble with your, simply having trouble with your, um, with your speaker, you're welcome to put your vote in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. And we're on to the Alano Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse, Minneapolis, Hennepin County. And back to Dennis. Everything okay, Dennis? You're muted. If Dennis has frozen up here. Oh, there we go. Not sure if there's a connection issue or. Chair Anderson, can you hear me? Oh, yes, now I can hear you. Yep. Okay. Hey. And okay. Your I was having problems with my speaker. Yeah, your PowerPoint presentation. Yep, now it's back, but it's not in presentation mode at the moment. Okay. Okay, how about now? Can you see it all right? Yes, although I think you're on oh. slide 29. Let's see here. Okay, this is uh, the Alano Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse. It's in Minneapolis, Hennepin County. The authors are Tamara Halverson and Lauren Anderson of New History. And again, I just wanna make sure that everybody can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. The Alano Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse is home to Minnesota's first chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is commonly known as AA. It proved to be the state's most influential chapter of the organization, which was established to assist alcoholics in their struggle with addiction. The building was purchased in 1942 and was previously the residence of wealthy industrialist John Washburn. And our view here is of the east facade and we are looking west. The Eleanor Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse is located at 2218 First Avenue South, 
to the south of the Minneapolis downtown core and several blocks to the east of Lake of the Isles. It is the in the Whittier neighborhood and is part of the locally designated Washburn Fair Oaks Historic District. And it's a little hard to see there, but if you look at that arrow, uh, you can see it uh, highlighted. The green rectangle seen here shows the historic boundary of the property, which is composed of three parts forming an L shape and a parking lot. The original Washburn residence is a three story shingle style building that was constructed in 1887. A two story brick garage erected in 1916 is located to the southwest of the house and a two story reinforced concrete addition constructed in 1950 is immediately to the south rear of the residence and connects it to the garage. The Washburn house features multiple projecting round bays and has a cross hipped roof with dormers. It rests on a stone foundation and has brick chimneys, a wraparound porch with wood columns and balustrade, wood trim and shingle siding. And at left is the east facade. Our view there is to the west, and at right is the south side with our view to the north. In this photo, we can see some of the details of the Washburn residence, such as the wraparound porch with wood columns and turned balusters, as well as the stone foundation. And here we're looking to the southwest. The brick garage, which we see at left, has an asphalt shingle roof and a modest porch with wood pediments supported by wood columns and posts. It also features brick headers and sills at the windows and a brick chimney. The 1950 edition, which is at right, is simple in form with a flat roof, glass block windows, brick sills, and stucco siding. The interior of the clubhouse features some handsome spaces, such as the common area at left, which has floor to ceiling coffered wood paneling, built in wood bookcases and one bookcase with leaded glass doors. The space also has a wood fireplace with stone surround, as well as a historic plaster ceiling illustrating geometric designs. The view here is to the southwest. And the image at right is of the crying room which is likely the original study. It too has floor to ceiling coffered wood paneling, built in wood cabinets, a decorative plaster ceiling, and a stone clad fireplace. And our view is to the Northwest. This is a view of a third level storage room in the 1887 house. And we are looking to the North. Other spaces in the clubhouse are more modest in appearance, such as the auditorium in the 1916 garage in the 1950 edition, which is at left, as well as the second level meeting room in the 1950 edition, which we see at right. The photo at left is a view to the north, while that at right is a view to the northwest. Alcoholics Anonymous became one of the most influential organizations to help individuals batting, battling alcohol addiction. It was founded by Bill Wilson and Bob Smith. During the mid 1930s, the two shaped their philosophy, which was highly spiritual and sought to convince alcoholics to give their lives over to a higher power and to rely on the experiences of other recovering alcoholics. In 1939, they formally established Alcoholics Anonymous. Membership in the organization grew rapidly and a chapter ultimately came to Minnesota in 1941, which was established in Minneapolis. As was consistent with national trends, a lot of clubs were created to purchase property for use by the AA, which generally did not own property. 
Essentially, Alana Clubs acted as landlords for the AA, providing space for meetings, lectures, and other activities. So it was that the Alana Society of Minneapolis was created and purchased the Washburn residence for use by the first AA chapter in Minnesota in 1942. From this beginning, the activities at the Alano Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse ass assisted with the creation of several additional chapters in different parts of the state, with a number formed in the Twin Cities area. With expansion beyond Minneapolis, AA ultimately formed AA's Minneapolis Intergroup, also known as the Central Office, to organize and disseminate information, as well as provide referrals. This happened in 1968, although the Minneapolis chapter of AA continues to be housed in the building at 2218 First Avenue South. And at left, we see the 1887 house in 1941, soon before it was purchased by the Alano Society of Minneapolis. At right is a 1943 photo showing Bill Wilson in the library of the building. Wilson first traveled to Minneapolis to visit with fellow AA members in 1941 when the AA was located in a different building. The period of significance is 1942 to 1968. The level of significance is local. National register criteria is A. Area of significance is social history. The period of significance for the building begins when the residence of wealthy industrialist John Washburn was acquired by the Alano Society in 1942 and continues until 1968, when a number of operating functions pass to the Minneapolis AA Intergroup. The Alano Society Minneapolis Clubhouse, commonly known as 2218 for its address, is the headquarters of the most influential chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous in the state of Minnesota. It was established in 1941 and is the original Minneapolis chapter of AA. While it is the state's first chapter of AA, it also served as an information hub for AA chapters in the larger Minneapolis area. According to the nomination, quote, through its members' encouragement with alcoholics in Minneapolis and the surrounding region, I'm sorry, that's engagement with alcoholics in Minneapolis and the surrounding region, Minneapolis. 2218's influence extended beyond its members and AA itself to the broader community, unquote. For this reason, reason the Alano Society of Minneapolis Clubhouse is eligible for listing in the National Register. And we do have one piece of correspondence uh, for this property. In a, letter, in a letter dated August 12th, 2021, the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission offered its unanimous support for listing the building, uh, the clubhouse in the National Register of Historic Places. Thank you, Dennis. Is there anyone uh, in the audience who would like to speak about this nomination? Is there anyone on the board who would like to speak about this nomination? Uh, Chair, this is board member Shulke. Go ahead. Well, I just, as a his local historian, I just found this fascinating, this uh, nomination, uh, especially for its uh, social history. Uh, you know, it kind of, uh, they talked about the, later on the Minnesota model, but how um, Minnesota was really a pioneer in not only the alcoholism, but the whole mental health aspect. And, you know, it, it brought to mind that famous photograph of uh, Governor Youngdahl of burning straitjackets in the, at the Anoka State Hospital in 1949 to demonstrate the state's commitment to, to treatment because uh, they considered alcoholism a disease. So, I mean, besides the architecture and, and the, the great building, um, I think the history behind this is, is just fascinating. So I congratulate the uh, um, the writers of this uh, nomination. Thank you, Board Member Schulke. And I see that Cheryl Larson has a hand raised. Hi, I'm Cheryl Larson. I'm the treasurer Cheryl. of the Board of Trustees of the Alano Society of Minneapolis. 
one of the pieces that wasn't conveyed is we are actually the world's longest continuously running AA club in the same location. In the same location. And so we've held that designation since 1942. In fact, with the help of a state senator and the Department of Health and staff at the governor's office, we actually also stayed open the entire pandemic and received con thank yous from the deputy chief of police as well as a state senator for that as well. Our club has had spinoffs not only through the Minneapolis area, but all through, also through greater Minnesota and into the Dakotas and down into Iowa and Wisconsin. There's, there's an Alano club in Fergus Falls. Yes, there is, hmm. and it has ties to us. We have a lot. There's an Alano club also in Faribault that directly ties to a snowstorm in which two gentlemen from Minneapolis were down in Faribault and didn't have a meeting to go to because they got stuck <laughs> down there. They started a club down in Faribault. So it's, it's really interesting cool. how our ties spread so widely and they are directly related to the Minnesota model that one of the commissioners referenced. In fact, our founder, Pat Cronin, has a unit named after him at Hazelden because of that Minnesota model and the ties. Very cool. I, Thank I'd you. I'm happy to an answer any other questions as well. Thank you Thanks. so much for your consideration and time. Any other comments or questions? This is board member Warner. One of the things I find so fascinating with this particular nomination is that often we assume that um, national register nominations have to go with specific architecture and that it all must sort of the entire building. And this is a perfect example of that criterion A social history argument, the, the history argument, and you look at the building and you realize it can be on national register and have these disparate connected uh, pieces that were built at different times. So I think that's just a super fascinating thing for, you know, maybe the public to um, try to understand and, and it, it's just sort of the perfect picture of that. Other comments or questions about this nomination? Anything else? Are we ready for a motion? Yeah, this I'll is do board member. Oh. Go, go ahead, Mary. You... This is board member Warner, and I will uh, move to enter this into the National Register. Thank you, and Mary. Board member Schulke, I'll second. Thank you, Chris, very much. Any other discussion? Okay, just a reminder, Amy likes to have your cameras on when we're voting. Just, oh. I'm just saying. Board <laughs> member Anderson says yes. Board member Decker? We'll come back to you. Or Michelle Decker could vote instead of John Decker. That would be a <laughs> solution. Board member Dyer? Aye. Thank you, board member James? Aye. Thank you. Board Member Koski? Aye. Board Member Lavasser? Aye. Thanks. Board Member Mann? Aye. Board Member Schulke? Aye. Board Member Solomonson? Aye. Board Member Stark? Aye. Board Member Warner? Aye. And circling back to Board Member Decker? Thumbs up, thumbs down. You're muted, John. And put it in the chat. That's what we learned. Amy will take your vote in the chat. So it passes. Thanks very much, everybody. And Amy, Ginny, Dennis, anything else that we need to know before we have a motion to adjourn? Well, I was just going to mention with my cameras on encouragement that I, I watched uh, a little bit of the last capital, the cap board, uh, board meeting. It was the capital area architectural planning board meeting and they actually instead of doing roll call they use their cameras and they raise their hands and so when the chair asked for a motion you know called for the the vote anybody she said anyone you know with an i raise your hand and then if you dissented usually that sometimes for clarification 
um, required a, a call out. So I was just kind of testing a little bit. Yeah. There might be another, you know, it seemed very efficient because they didn't do, they didn't do the roll call. Um, mm -hmm. But we'd have to have everybody's cameras, you know, working um, in order for that to, for that to happen. So just something sure. to think about for the yeah. next meeting potentially. Yep. Great. Anything else? Gary Anderson, thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, board board members, thank you all. Thank you. I second um, that. This is a wonderful discussion of a lot of very interesting properties. So yeah. thank you for your yeah. engagement all and, right. and your work to, to be prepared for this meeting. We didn't have 15 tonight like we have earlier. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm free till midnight if you know, <laughs> we have a few more that we need to look at tonight. Wait for it. You have to save your energy for the April meetings. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. All right. I think that that does it. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank, Thank you, too. everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.